Welcome to a very special episode of Ask the Expert on Contingent Workforce Strategies LinkedIn Group. And I've got a really cool topic for today, and I've got a really cool group of people to talk to about this topic. And the topic is optimizing workforce flexibility while embracing contract talent in the contingent labor industry. And what that means is why aren't we or how can we drink our own Kool-Aid in the contingent workforce industry by utilizing freelance consultants and more flexible workers within our industry? And I've got the crew from the Contingent Workforce Institute with me today to talk about this. And it's gonna be a really cool, cool conversation. So Michelle Cox, Candace Hammer and Dustin Talley, thanks for joining me today. Um, and wanted to give the audience a little bit of background on each of your backgrounds. So to start off, Candace, give us a little bit of background uh, about your, your career and where you're at today. Great. Thanks for having me. Um, 17 plus years in some form or fashion of human capital management, specializing in contingent labor. So started my career in recruiting and moved into the VMS, MSP world and uh, quickly moved into consulting and doing my own independent consulting in this space, which is what I do today. Um, working with organizations on their talent to organizational strategy and alignment. Awesome. Dustin? Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Good crew. Good to be with you all. Um, uh, 15, 16 years in the space, uh, MSP, VMS as well. Uh, more so independent contractor payrolling, direct sourcing. Probably spent a decade doing that. Got enough courage to also go independent. I'd sat around independence for a decade myself and kind of like had the itch and then finally scratched it. Um, and now I see all the challenges with it. So excited to talk about incorporating more of what we're doing into the industry. Amazing. And Michelle, please let us know a little bit about your history. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. So I started in this industry as a program lead. So I led my own program and did that for about five years. And at the same time, I was going through and getting my certification from an executive coach and leadership training. So I was doing both at the same time. And I've evolved and I've left corporate America about 10 years ago to having my own coaching practice. I coach a lot of executives in this space. And, and really, I'm passionate about seeing executives thrive and seeing they, them being able to have a trickle effect of leadership throughout their organization. And that involves touching contingent labor in every fashion. So, you know, one of the interesting things and why I think this is a pretty neat topic is we consult and as vendors and consultants in the industry, we're always consulting on you know, the optimization of a flexible workforce and a contingent workforce in the industry. And we're encouraging it. And we've seen the growth of usage of contingent workers. But looking at the history of our own industry, you know, be it the supply side or even, you know, the organizations themselves, um, we haven't been the largest users of contingent or freelance workers. You know, we have used it a little bit, but not really, like I've said before, drank our own Kool-Aid and um, engaged with consultants and, and freelancers on a larger scale, which has always been kind of fascinating to me. So, you know, what's some of the reasons why that is happening? I'll jump in and take this. I think coming, starting my career on the staffing side and working in the VMS, MSP side, I think there's, there's, you know, your services and your customer service side, your customer facing positions. And I think so many organizations don't want to turn over that staff, right? They want that consistency on the customer facing positions. But there's a lot of back end support, right? That the 
data analytics, the project management support, kind of that advisory um, support on the back end, leadership support, right, that I think um, really could benefit from a flexible workforce and the contingent workforce within our own industry, right? But I can understand where um, organizations that have those customer facing positions aren't going to want to turn that over or use flexible work to come in for short term. And I think companies have been doing it, um, maybe not at scale and certainly not everyone across the board. Um, you could look at what happened in tech and marketing, right? If you look at those two spaces within tech, a lot more people started going independent and now you can go tap into an independent developer pool. Marketing, it's been this way for a long time. I think that's happening across occupations and industries. And now we're seeing that in our space, right? There's a lot more of these independents and what do I do with them, right? And I shouldn't just say independents, right? They're contract workers, right? They could come in in a number of different ways. Uh, but I think the time has kind of caught up and we've been hearing this in news headlines where people are leaving the traditional way of working. Um, and I think there's a lot of people like some of us on this call that need to be incorporated into that mix. And so I'm excited to figure out and to even discuss here today what that starts to look like. Yeah, you're, you're starting to see that demographic shift. And I think even the pandemic helped push it that way as well, where people enjoy having that uh, flexibility and balance between lifestyle and work. And, you know, that remote work has... <laughs> They've embraced that, right? Um, and I don't know, it, you know, we always talk about it also as it, it economically driven too, where, um, you know, you're trying to utilize people to manage those peaks and valleys where you know there may be needs for people, but you don't have the the business to do that so you hire in a flexible workforce or vice versa right where you're coming off those situations and and you're hiring to to manage and smooth out those those uh peaks and valleys within your workforce so you know it might be also an economic driven scenario where um and then once those situations happen you you tend to get used to it so we may be going into that cycle and i think it's it's actually a very interesting topic at a very interesting time to talk about mm -hmm. i know for me personally when i um made the leap from corporate to consulting what for was very much for personal reasons i had a daughter at the time and was coming back from maternity leave wasn't going to commute an hour to two hours a day right so it needed that flexibility um and was able to get, I was really lucky, right? Was able to get projects based on my corporate life previously, people that I worked with. And um, that made my life a lot easier to then be, a, you know, a mom at the time. It's still a mom, obviously, but um, and be a mom and take care of what I needed to there and have the flexibility to take on project work um, was really helpful for me. And going to your point about the economic turns, right? I think we see a lot more of that in different the instability, right? I see it often when that the economy is unstable, potential election year, you see you know, everyone kind of freeze on hiring and wanting to use flexible workforce. Yeah, but the work itself has not stopped, right? No. I think we keep all hearing that there are many companies that are about to make decisions on things and it's not if, it's when the work comes through. Uh, and so that's the challenge, right? I, you need the workforce ready to go to demand, deliver on the demand that is going to come in inevitably. Uh, yet companies, to your point, have had to shed workers and appease shareholders and things like that. So it'll be interesting to see what Q1 looks like uh, and, and just kind of track with how organizations flex up and flex down uh, with mm -hmm. what's about to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I think historically, we also didn't necessarily in this space had the breadth of expertise that in independent consultants or contractors, however we want to phrase it, that we do today, because organizations have been shifting up and down and back and forth. And there's there's been a shift down. I think that we all see it and recognize it. And a lot of those folks have chosen not to go back into a corporate environment, but have chosen to say, I'm going to take the contractor 
independent consultant route now. This is who I want to be in the industry. And now there's even a larger pool of talent that have that specialized expertise where we may not have had it previously. We've always had it in tech and Dustin brought that up before, but really on the other side of the house, if you're looking at the front end of it, now you're starting to see that expertise coming to the table and you're able to use it. Yeah, you know, that, that came to mind 100%. And, you know, the specialization of the skills within our industry, it was evolving industry, but now we're maturing as an industry and have, you know, look around this, this conversation. We've got 10, 15, 20, and 30 years of experience. <laughs> and so that expertise now is matured and that pool of talent, Michelle, like you say, is there and mature um, so that, you know, that can be uh, a talent pool for that's available where maybe in the past it companies were developing that skill set and 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 had a smaller group of individuals that trying to build a larger pool of talent that has that experience so you're right it, it, it's the timing is interesting as well where there is a good um pool of talent that is choosing to be independent uh as well so it's it's really I cool time that we're I wonder in. if I wonder if we're choosing as much as like I've I've heard the talk track uh that employment is breaking down and I don't think this is across the board by the way there's a lot of people that are employed that are probably listening to this today um but the the thought of employment is roughly 150 years old um and before that you had like apprentices and people had their own occupations right the blacksmith the baker that kind of thing I think this cycle is kind of just starting to repeat itself a little bit. And now it's optimizing, right? Because employment will always be a thing. But there are people who are like, I want to hang my shingle. I want to go be the baker, right? Uh, so to speak. Um, and so it's it's fascinating. I think we do have to figure out ways to incorporate those types of workers into the mix, which I think is what we're trying to do within CWI. Um, so yeah, it, it, it I like to say it that way. We're not choosing. I think the cycle is just playing out. Mm-hmm. I was thinking about, uh, you know, we all have a past. We all have no different technologies that we've worked with or implemented. And, you know, our industry is so small. When we go to conferences, doesn't it feel like a college reunion, right? Every, everybody, we all know each other in some form or fashion, which is fun. That's what I love about this industry as well. But also we've left those organizations those relationships, hopefully we've maintained a lot of them. And those of us that have gone out to, you know, explore and, or you go fully, jump fully into consulting. I mean, those are the ones, those are the people you want to work with because they're going out and they're, they have to hustle, right? It's not a job that's being handed to them. They have to hustle to get the work. And, you know, it's not for everyone, but personally, I, love that. You have to wear all the hats, right? And those are usually the people you want to come bring back in and work with, right? Cuz they're they're going to get stuff done. They've got to they know how to get out there and hustle. Yeah. Jeff, are you I know you do a lot of stuff with independents over the years, right? Are you are you seeing that across the board that there are a lot more people going contract uh forget our industry for a moment, right? There's are there trends that are speaking to this as well? Yeah, you know, the statistics that we all talk about and the analysts talk about, we've gone from kind of 15% of the workforce to 20 to 30 to, you know, really approaching that 45, 50% of the workforce. And then within that, a lot of them are like the, what we're talking about, the ones that are somewhat choosing to be independent and it's a, a number of reasons that I think we've all talked about. So, um, and it's not just within our, our industry. I think our industry is actually a little bit behind that curve. Um, but if you look at um, the IT space, the marketing space, and now you're getting into the legal realms, the procurement realms, everybody is starting to say, hey, wait a second. I, I you know, I've enjoyed working for someone but I've got the expertise now to go out on my own. And the, generally, although you're hustling, there is demand for that services. Um, 
because if you think about the demographics, we had the baby boom generation, massive. The next generation is very small. And to try to fill those, um, those positions that the past generation had been in is difficult. So the demand curve is still there. And so it's kind of putting the, you know, the power in the talent pool's hands to say, I want to work this way versus be beholden to you where you're asking me to come into the office, to work this way, to work the hours, to give up my life for you. So I think it's a very demographically driven demand curve as well. Uh, that's enabling people to say, okay, I'm out, I'm, I'm doing this and actually fulfilling on it. Whereas in the past, you know, if you said you were going out independent, you know, it'd be a success was not a given. You really had to hustle to be run a bunch of the jobs together to, and the demand may have not been there for independence to come in. So, you know, I think the timing is there and we're riding a wave of demographics as well. I love that statement, Jeff, especially about that, how the demographics have changed what it is. I, I heard a recent story from an organization. They're like, we can't fill this role. We can't fill this role. No, you can fill the role. You just don't want to fill the role in the way that the demographic wants to do the role. So mm -hmm. it, and there, and it's a shift even from organizations to understand that you can't have it the way it always was. Mm -hmm. And you have to be able to be flexible and you have to be able to be willing to shift your lens and being willing to shift how you've always done it to meet the what your actual, what your employees need and what they want. Otherwise you just go without it. Michelle, I was going to say that that's so true. We, we focus so much on the flexibility for the worker, but there is so much flexibility for the organization, right? If they have the willingness to embrace that. So you made such a great point there. I, I think there's, you know, those organizations that do embrace that, there's so many benefits for them as well, right? Well, if you look at, I don't know, 95% of the requisitions that come out in contingent labor, most of them are staff on the, the, for some reason, we still think of things as a work week. I don't know why it's work that's being done. It's not necessarily a work week, but again, that's the employment mindset. Uh, and I think that's some of what the next chapter is, is how do we unweave that and then incorporate, not just in our space, this is happening across the board. Um, but yeah, I want to talk a little more about the, you're ta tapping into it here, Candace, like the benefits to organizations and just tapping into this, right? What, what do you guys think are some of the benefits if they were to effectively take talent that are not full-time employees and incorporate them into what they're doing? Well, you know, getting back to the talent, generally the best talent that is the most confident and doing great work that feels confident in their demand for their mm -hmm. services is the best talent too. So I'll start that off at, in answering your question is think about the most experienced, the people that have done the most things often are the ones that are confident enough to go out and say, I can string a, a number of engagements together to, to um, fulfill what my compensation level was and or my needs are. And so, you know, Tapping into that expertise and the best talent is one of the first benefits I see personally. Mm -hmm. Well, I would also say just from a financial perspective, if you have ebbs and flows in your business, it meets the needs for your ebbs and flows of business. You're not constantly carrying the weight when mm -hmm. you may not have the actual work to support the weight. So instead of like hiring, laying people off, hiring, and like you go through that cycle, you now have the demand that you have the people you need to support the demand that's there for work when you need it. I totally agree with that. I, I can't remember if it was all of us talking about this at one point, but we were saying if it was actually done right, you'd actually never have to have these massive layoffs, hiring type things happening because you'd be bringing people into the organization the right way. And you might start contract a perm. That sounds like a noble thought, right? Isn't that how <laughs> this industry started back in the day? Um, there's the 
talk track around utilization rates. And I think professional services companies have been looking at this for years, right? They have their like consulting bench of talent that they deploy on their projects. Um, and they finally got wise enough, I don't know, maybe 10, 15 years ago. And they said, oh, our utilization is what actually matters. We want our FTEs as close to 100% utilized as possible. Um, but then we're going to get projects and we need to be able to flex and support those projects. So I think on an aggressive model, what I've seen is like a 60-40, where like 60% of the workforce is full-time. The other 40% is some version of contract, outsource, freelance, you name it, right? But it's on the other side. I think that's the challenge I would put out to organizations in our space is what does your utilization rate need to look like so that next year you don't have to lay people off? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One, one of the things that I find interesting, and I think that this will just open up another piece of this little puzzle that we have is I think forecasting has always been a big challenge in this industry. Mm -hmm. And there's like a trickle effect that happens. So we don't, and I can say, even from the program side, when I was leading a program, us being able to forecast was a bit of a joke. So from staffing suppliers perspective, they're like, well, we don't really know when the work is going to ebb, ebb and flow. And even from a vent, you know, from a technology perspective, we don't necessarily always know because there's a lot of new technologies. So they don't have historical data to be able to forecast to say, this is when I know that I'm going to have ebbs and flows. So I think that there's still, even to this day, there's an opportunity for us to, and I'm not saying we're going to find the answer now, but <laughs> to, to, to really take a look at how do we forecast so we are able to support the ebbs and flows. What are your thoughts? Uh, the forecasting part, you're absolutely right. I've sat in so many of those forecasting meetings where someone either sandbags the number or they get really aggressive. And the truth is, most of us in this industry don't control the throttle on that. You're relying on the client as well as your own efforts. And so it's a combined kind of equation that no one has the answer to. Um, so I think being prepared for the fact that you don't have an answer is probably a good strategy. You need a like a full-time researcher, right? That's going out and researching the trends of every customer, right? That's, you know, what their utilization is, every industry and how that impacts our industry. So I think that's what makes it so hard for our industry to forecast. And then, you know, you get something like a pandemic that comes along and throws everyone off, right? It's almost like instead of a, you know, economist or a researcher, we need a futurist or someone that can, you know, read the future. Well, so. If you're in healthcare, you crushed it. If you were in, um, you know, the hotel industry, you did yeah. not. And yeah. your time ratio <laughs> really mattered too. Right. Um, oh, yeah. It's really oh. hard to, to really Wait, just, I will say this, Justin, going back to your point. If you had a certain percentage of your workforce and you plan for that, so no matter what, let's just say 30% is going to be contingent labor and 70% is going to be permanent, you then have a lever to really flex in and out mm -hmm. versus having 100%, all mm -hmm. being one way or another. Yeah. And when it, like, I'm not even saying use independence, I'm saying start people out as contractors and hire them when the like you're actually got to that level. Uh, but yeah, a lot of organizations hire way ahead of that for some reason. Yes. Mm -hmm. The expert Your scarcity, right? <laughs> yeah. And the, the, you know, when you think about what we talk about is, is hiring for the expertise too. And I think the, the evolution of our industry and the changes that are going on and some new entrants coming in as well to lead some of that change, you know, I, I remember when starting a company, you just, you do it and then you gain the experience, right? Coming in as a new organization to this industry, right? You'd be like, whoa, how does this work? And why is there MSPs? And what is this via, like the acronyms we use and how the ecosystem intertwines is evolved, right? And, and it's, unless you've been in it, sometimes it doesn't make sense to outsiders. And so some of that expertise, like you've said, Michelle, in the past, that has been built up in the talent pool 
just by being in it over the years and seeing how it's evolved and the interconnectivity of the ecosystems and the why things are is probably incredibly valuable to new entrants into this that are looking to change the future of work, right? I know there's been a lot of conversations, what is new is old again. And I think that's also leading to this interesting dynamic of as talent is wanting to become independent and work more flexible for their own reasons, some of the new entrants into the organ into our industry are looking to tap into the expertise based on, you know, I don't want to call it legacy, but maybe it is legacy at this point that has that experience that can accelerate their entrance into the market versus stubbing their toe with the uniqueness of our industry, right? Mm -hmm. It's a good yeah. point. I saw it. Uh, I guess I'm making up this stat, but I researched this stat. Let's say it that way. Um, there are 1,100 people worldwide that have a contingent labor background that say they're a business of one. That's fairly significant for our industry. Add to that the number of people that are searching for work and or have been laid off recently, that number probably quadruples. So we're talking 5,000 people that could be engaged in different ways in businesses in this upcoming year. Um, and I think that's fairly meaningful uh, if we were to take that 5,000 and apply a different strategy than what we've been looking at all along. Mm -hmm. So we've talked a lot about pros and cons, the benefits, the why often. Now, you know, as I always like to do is, is the how, right? And that's sometimes tricky. Um, but, you know, what are some insights into how do you optimize when you're looking to utilize the contingent workforce within our own industry, right? And change our ways so that we're optimizing utilization rates, we're taking advantage of expertise, like, how do you do that? And what are some of the step next steps that uh, organizations can do uh, other than just calling up CWI, of course, but like, what are some of those best practices that you foresee that organizations should think about while engaging and using more independent contractors in our industry? I think taking a hard look internally, right? At what are those roles that I may look to unfortunately cut right? Or need to when things are down a bit and, or just that those flexible roles that we can bring expertise in on a project base. So I would say for the supply side of our organization, it's, it's taking a look and then building those relationships with the independents that are out there and being able to make Make sure they know you and you know them, right? They're the ones that are out talking to buying organizations every day and hearing what the buying organization's needs are from those suppliers. So I think that connected relationship between the two um, is really important, right? Proximity is power. Make sure they know you and you know them and you're able to bring them in hopefully when they have flexibility as well and that they're potentially speaking to you and matching you with the right customers um, that are out there looking for your services. And I think it goes without saying, I, or maybe it doesn't because I say this in every talk, but I always say everybody needs a talent pool. Um, mm -hmm. And that's true in this use case as well, right? For our industry, if you do direct sourcing and you don't have your own talent pool, I'm going to challenge you, why the heck don't you? You should have a talent pool. Otherwise, you shouldn't be talking about it. Um, I had that same epiphany about six months ago. That's somewhat of how the tech part of CWI even came into existence. Um, I tell everyone they need a talent pool. And I was like, wait, I don't have one. We should have a talent pool for our industry. So that that is a, in part what CWI is. But I think to your question, Jeff, I think every organization needs something like that where they have a tap into like who might be available to do some of those roles. I'll go a step further though. Um, you know, there's a lot of interesting innovation or, or potential innovation within organizations, right? These great ideas that come across in some of these board meetings. Uh, and inevitably what happens is they're like, you know, Sarah is great at that. Let's give that to Sarah. Mind you, Sarah has another full-time job in this organization and she somehow has to do that and help you get this innovative thing pushed along. 
And so I don't think innovation dies on the vine as much as you've just got your resources stretched thin. And so my challenge would be, maybe you'd bring in a consultant or an expert who can help bring those innovative things to fruition versus trying to rely on your internal resources. Now you're gonna get into like the IP conversations and all of that stuff as well. And that all has to be figured out. But I think the resourcing is the challenge, not the innovation sometimes. And Dustin, I would take what you said and I would actually flip it to that last piece. I would find somebody to do Sarah's role <laughs> and then, and really then let's, and let Sarah go to the innovation. Yeah. So yeah. you create a win-win in everything that you're doing. But I do think it goes back to what we had said earlier is really doing an assessment of utilization of the roles within your organization and really have an understanding of what roles are at full utilization or that are over utilization. I mean, because let's face it, we, I keep seeing it more and more, especially in with the executives I'm working with, we need to do more with less. So their utilization rate of what was once hundred percent. Now the expectation is 120%. So I think really understanding what the utilization is of each and every employee within an organization and looking at what are the high priority what is like, yes, we have to take care of this and what's low priority and really starting to look and assess how can we bring people in so we're delivering on the highest priority, but we're not letting go of low priority. It's just, we have a plan. So you can then start taking care of your business in every fashion without sacrificing one thing for another. I love hearing Coach Michelle come out. I no, know? me too. I was just thinking that. I, I wanted to ask a kind of a coaching question, Michelle, because I the organizations I work with a lot have a hard time uh, measuring utilization, right? It's really tough for them to, to take a seat at the table and really look at all of those individual roles and how they measure their utilization. I didn't know if you had any tips or tricks in coaching for um, organizations in that area. Well, first look at what you're assigning to them. I mean, that is like a really good just baseline. And sometimes people don't even know of, okay, how much how much work, what are they all responsible for? Because job descriptions are just a thing. And I use my quotes because they're just a thing. They're not the actual of what someone's actually responsible for. So document, have that person document everything they're responsible for. And then have them put hours towards each one of those very things and then inspect it. And that starts giving you a baseline. How many hours are we spending a week? Not only is it going to tell you how, on what tasks they're spending it on and thinking of process improvements, it's also going to show you how utilize, how much am I utilizing this one person over other people? And mm -hmm. how can we seamlessly start leveraging this out? Mm -hmm. So true. That's the mm -hmm. simplest. I know. I love it. And really looking at it to help, you know, limit burnout within organizations too, because there's so many organizations that have employees that are working so wearing so many hats and having to work more hours than they ever have before right now. Right. Agree. Thousand percent. The other part is I encourage. Okay. So I, now you've got me on my soapbox uh -huh. here. If you are a worker and you are being overutilized, it's starting to like a lot of people are fearful to say, no, I can't do that. It is okay to say yes. And if I choose, if you want me to prioritize this, then these two things are going to fall off. So mm -hmm. what's the priority mm -hmm. or it can be yes. And I won't deliver it till here right. and I can deliver it here. So it's also that empowering yourself to push back. Yeah. yeah, expectations and boundaries, right? I love it. I have to remind myself of that all the time. Set expectations and boundaries. <laughs> yes. That's a really good point, Michelle, because I, I I have a lot of conversations with people that think, well, maybe I need to just go consult and that fixes the problem you're mentioning there. Uh, and it actually wouldn't because they would take on way too much, right? Right. And then over promise, under deliver. And I think that's mm -hmm. true both in the consultant mindset as well as the employee. So really, really good advice there. Mm -hmm. I killed myself when I first was a consultant. I said yes to everything. You want me to do this? I'll do it. And then I was like, oh crap, what am I doing? I'm not, <laughs> I need to coach myself in this moment. What am I doing? So. And I think optimizing the consultant's 
um, time balancing acts is what we'll have to talk about in the next session. So uh, this has been a fascinating conversation about how to optimize the usage of contingent labor and contingent workforce within the contingent workforce industry. And I wanna thank each of you from the bottom of my heart, not only for this conversation, but joining in on the journey of building out the talent pool for the contingent workforce industry within the Contingent Workforce Institute consulting practice. So thanks so much for this session. It's been great. And I think there's gonna be a part two in the near future. <laughs> Thank you, Jack.